Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another live edition of your program Ask Huda. I begin by praising Allah the Almighty alone and sending the best peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 0020238551 or 132 the Facebook page is the R Muhammad Salah official. We had only one pending question from the previous episode um, actually two. Uh, but let me take first uh, the first caller and hopefully inshallah I'll get to answer depending questions before answering today's question. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Hamid from the case. Hey, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Great, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Akhi Hamid. Yeah, please, please pray for my wife. She is not feeling well for some time. I ask Allah the Great to give her a quick recovery. Shafaha Allah wa afaha. Shukran jazeeran ya akhi. Now if what we earn some interest from the bank on our deposited amount, mm. and that amount, uh, the interest, we don't want to leave it in the bank, can we use this interest on helping someone by way of paying the, towards the education or schooling or uniform or something to the children of someone? Can we do that? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Brother Hamid. Um, we agreed initially that if the person has nowhere to deposit his money, but in a conventional bank, it becomes permissible. And if there is an interest that is generated as a result, he should get rid of it. Uh, in any of the permissible ways, such as giving it to a school, to a hospital, uh, to an orphanage, giving it to a poor person, that is uh, permissible. But uh, that is not an act of charity. This is simply trying to get rid of uh, something has earned, has been earned unlawfully due to necessity. Thank you, Brother Hamid, and may Allah give shifa to your wife and to all those who are sick. Amen. Brother Muhammad from the case. A. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Shaykh. How are you, Shaykh? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you, Akhi, for asking. Alhamdulillah. Shaykh, I have a question. Say, um, you know, I, I heard about the Islamic mortgage, which says um, the, um, you can have, a, you know, the both uh, partnership. Uh, I, if I say put a 10%, then they will put 90%, and then, um, you know, it's a diminishing musharaka, musharaka, I say. Mm. And uh, according to them, it is a halal mortgage. So I wonder whether it's such a correct say. Can you please uh, enlighten on that one? Hi. Simply for any business transaction that is done in the United States and North America in general, and particularly with regards to all the banks or the financial institutes, which are labeled as Islamic, you will find all the answer in details uh, on our website of AMJA, the uh, Sharia Scholar Association of North America, uh, so that you may find the particular uh, financial institute that you're talking about and whether it is reliable um, with regards to its uh, business transaction, it's halal or haram. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Because what you said is perfectly fine, but we're talking about the practical application of al-murabaha or uh, al-musharaka. So that the Sharia committee have uh, answered uh, all these questions. Um, now, um, Brother Musad from the UK, in the last episode, asked about a hadith, which he said that uh, uh, about the 12 Imams from uh, Quraysh. Yes, indeed. In the last minute of the previous episode, I said that's a sound hadith narrated by Jabir ibn Samurah. May Allah be pleased with him. He said he once entered upon the Prophet وسلم, along with his father. And you heard them saying, إن هذا الأمر لا ينقضي حتى يمضي فيهم إثنى عشر خليفة. Then he said that the Prophet, uh, first of all, he said that he heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إن هذا الأمر. The word الأمر here refers to our religion. This matter will not be over 
this religion and the Muslim state would not be over, would not come to an end, except after having 12 Khalifa. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said in the same hadith that Kulluhum min Quraysh. Uh, this narration is a sound narration which is uh, narrated by both Al-Bukhari or Muslim. Uh, all of them will be from the tribe of Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here the scholars elaborated on this hadith by saying that the 12 Imams, the 12 Imams refer to the 12 Khulafa who will be rightly guided, will be rightly guided. So they don't have to be consecutive, nor do they have to be simultaneous at the same time as some people say, no. Rather it means that those 12 rightly guided rulers of the Muslim Ummah who will be from the beginning to the very end ending up with um, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Mahdi may Allah be pleased with him who would come by the end of time from the offspring he's a descendant of the Prophet's family would have his name and his father's name Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Mahdi and his emergence and his appearance would be one of the major signs which just precede the occurrence of the Day of Judgment. And it will be at the same time with the descent of Isa, the son of Mary, peace be upon him. Okay. So they say that such as the four rightly guided Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali, may Allah be pleased with them. They were consecutive in the first 30 years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu as he predicted, al Khilafat al rashida then several, uh, several decades later, there came one of the Khulafa of Bani Umayyah, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, may Allah be pleased with him, who is known in the Seerah and in the history as the fifth rightly guided Khalifa, even though there have been many caliphs and rulers in between, between Ali ibn Abi Talib to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, may Allah be pleased with him. But because of his justice, because of his guidance, he is known in the seerah as Khamis al Khulafa al Rashidin. So, some of them have uh, already appeared, and some of them are to appear uh, yet. And the last one from the twelfth Khalifa from Quraysh as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted will be the Al-Mahdi, Muhammad ibn Abdullah Al-Mahdi. Okay, Barakallahu Fikum. Uh, Sister Aisha from Nigeria, um, she had three questions we answered to, and the third was about, what about sleeping while the light is on? Is it permissible? That is something entirely up to you. Maybe you're referring to the hadith which is narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, in which he quoted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying that, إِذَا جَنَحَ اللَّيْلُ أَوْ أَمْسَيْتُمْ فَكُفُّوا صُبِيَانَكُمْ Then in the last segment he said, وَأَطْفِئُوا مَصَابِيحَكُمْ And that's a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. But this is not pertaining the switch on and off and the light pulp, the fluorescent light, or whatever light that we're using, or the chandelier. Once the Nabi Sallallahu was sitting, and al fuaisiqa which refers to the little rebellious rat, dragged the light, which was simply um, an oil lamp. And it burned the rug, which the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting on. So the Prophet Sallallahu warned his companions that whenever you want to go to sleep, Turn the light off. Why? Because this fuaisiqa, this rat or this mouse can do that. Can drag the light which is simply based uh, on uh, an oil uh, lamp light. And it can burn the whole place while people are asleep. So this is the effective cause of the prohibition. And the prohibition here is a means of protection and prevention to block the means of burning while the people are asleep. It is not uh, something to categorize it as haram or forbidden. It is just a means of protection 
against the burning. Um, Brother Abdul Latif from Algeria. Um, uh, in order to beginning, no, it's Sister Fatima from Nigeria, because we an, we answered Abdul Latif from Nigeria in the last episode. Sister Fatima says, um, every time I perform ghost, can I do ghost without washing my hair due to uh, illness? In fact, al ghusl is washing the entire body with the intention of removing the major impurity as a result of finishing one's period for a woman or the post-delivery bleeding um, or after having an intimate relationship which results in complete sexual intercourse with or without sexual discharge, uh, experiencing with dreams. So that would require the person to perform ghusl, to wash the entire body from head to toe in order to lift the major impurity. Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, asked the Prophet وسلم, whether she has to undo her braids and unfold them every time she would perform ghusl or not. The Prophet وسلم, said, do not do that. Rather, you can perform ghusl and what really matters is that pouring the water on the entire body. So if the water reaches the scalp, the roots of the hair, it is, it is sufficient. And similarly, by washing the outer part of the braids or the hair, it is sufficient. If the person has some ailment or sickness, whereupon he or she will not be able to put the water on top of their heads, like severe hair fall, that happens. Uh, but it must be diagnosed as as some sort of sickness or disease. Not that just because the woman is afraid that it will mess up her hairstyle. Now we're talking about some sort of real sickness. The doctor says that, and epidermologist say that you should not put water on your hair because um, you know it will cause alopecia, you will get bald, it's causing hair fall, or you will get sick or because of an injury. In this case, the brother or the sister are allowed to perform ghusl without washing the hair. Rather, what you can do is two things. If it is permissible, according to your doctor's advice, to wipe with your wet hands over the hair, then you have to do that instead of washing. In addition to performing tayammum along with washing the entire body. So you will do ghusl as normal, except that there is a body part, in this case, it's your hair, it's your head, that you're not going to wash it because of the ailment. ما جعل عليكم في الدين من حرج. Allah did not put any burden on you when it comes to practicing your religion. And he says in Surah At-Taghabun, فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم. Keep your duty to Allah as much as you can. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, ما أمرتكم به فأتوا منه ما استطعتم وما نهيتكم عنه فاجتنبوه Whatever I commanded you to do, then do as much as you can of it. Well, it's actually advised that I should not put water on my head, on my face, on my arm, for whatever medical reason. In this case, do not put water on it. Wash the rest of the body and then perform tayammum. This tayammum will be instead of washing this body part, which should have been washed in wudu or in ghusl. Because a tayammum is valid to lift the major impurity as well, instead of performing ghusl. As explained before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مَنْ فَامْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مَنْ in the case of tayammum, فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا So if you find some sand, some dust, some stones which are being exposed to the sun and clean, tahir, sa'idan tayyiba. So what you need to do is one strike against it, against the sand, against the dust, then you clean up your hand and you wipe over your face with the same one you do your hands because this is the order. This is what Allah, what Allah the Almighty said in Surah An-Nisa. 
فامسحوا بوجوهكم your faces وأيديكم أيديكم it is sufficient to do الكفين according to Imam Abu Hanifa may Allah have mercy on him he said that it is required to do two strikes one for the face and he said the second is to wipe over not just the hands rather the arms including the elbows like in the same case of wudu the right first then the left first well Allah the Almighty says in the Quran فَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ while in ayah number 6 of Surah Al-Ma'idah he said فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ so wash your faces and wash your arms up to Al-Marafiq and Al-Marafiq which means the elbows are included but in the case of Tayammum he did not mention Al-Marafiq or the elbows this is just to make things simple and easy for us because this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he said إِنَّ الدِّينَ يُسْرِ وَلَنْ يُشَادَ الدِّينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَهُ our religion brothers and sisters is easy and if anyone were to make it difficult or hard for himself it will be hard وَلَنْ يُشَدَّ الدِّينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَهُ he said فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا so do your best in order to achieve the right thing but if you cannot achieve the ultimate goal and do it perfectly then at least close to it if any person is having a valid reason cannot perform ghusl uh, like in the case of this companion, Amr ibn al-As was leading an expedition in the battle of that is Salasil. Uh, then he experienced uh, ihtilam. He had a wood dream. And when he got up for Fajr prayer and it was extremely cold, uh, he consulted his companions, even though he was the Amir. He said, since weather is extremely cold, can I do tayammum instead of performing ghusl? They said, no, you have to perform most. He didn't. Rather, he performed tayammum. And since he was emir, he led them in the prayer. So when he returned, and the companions complained to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Am, asallayta bin nasi wa anta junub. Did you lead them in the prayer while you are in a state of janaba, major impurity? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard Allah is saying in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Don't you kill yourselves. Allah is merciful with you. So I was afraid to kill myself because the water was very cold. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and his smile is a sign of approval. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Sana from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Dr. Salah. Yeah. Sir, I have uh, four questions. No. Our first question is regarding my mother. She just told me to call you and ask. The thing is, uh, Dr. Fala, when she's praying, she's, she's, uh, she's complaining uh, and she's very worried about that she's forgetting when uh, if she has read the Surah Fatih or if she has done her ruku. So um, she has an issue with remembering. So she said, uh, in that case, uh, should I uh, pray again? or do the ruku again, and even if she does the sajda, sometimes she's forgetting. If mm. she has re recited it three times, or she's, uh, her, she's worried about her prayer. That's Sist my first question. Sister Sana, is it something that she developed recently because of old age or um, senility? No, or? I asked her the same thing. I no. think it, it, it is recently, not uh, before. Like right, right after we did our umrah, and we came back to Bahrain, I think after the uh, Two weeks, she's 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 saying this. Mm. Mm. Okay. So yeah, I told her maybe you know if so you have uh, your brain is going somewhere, it happens. You know if you if you have a worried life or something like that, or maybe waspasa or something, yeah. maybe because of that you're forgetting. I told her this, and she she said yes, it happens. But sometimes I'm naturally forgetting. Correct. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is this is my first question. Okay. Uh, the second question is um, Dr. Salah about the sajda. When I when I make sajda, my nose is not touching the floor. And my when my father was praying, his nose is touching the floor. So I am asking him how is it when the nose is you know uh, it's not in the same uh, um, height as that of the forehead. 
So I don't know how to then properly do the sedative because my nose is in the air. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, Sister Sana, um, one's forehead and nose should be in touch with the floor when one is offering sujood. That's a must. Um, sometimes when you have an elevated forehead, it's hard to have the entire forehead um, in level with the, with the nose so that they both would touch the, the floor. That's not necessary. It will be sufficient to touch any part of your forehead which comes in line with the nose. But you should actually put both your forehead and nose against the floor while you are in sujood. Okay? And try and let me know if you manage to do it. As I said, if it is not possible Please, because when I, of... When I end the call, I can, I can hear you well because I cannot hear you well now. Okay, okay. Okay, and one last question I have is about a dream. Is, is it okay if I can ask uh, any, if, if in public like that? No. No, it is not. Um, Walla? No. As far as dreams, uh, we avoid answering calls about dreams in the live show because we want to stick to the theme of the program, which is answering fiqh questions. Uh, any other questions, Sister Sana? Yeah, I was asking about the Sunnah prayer. Okay. I have four cycles of Sunnah. I pray that before Asar Parv. So is it okay? Because my mom was telling me that 12 Sunnah are, are Muaqqida. Mm. It, they are compulsory that we have to pray. So I do four uh, before my Asar prayer, like uh, before the uh, Asar Parv, if, if that's okay. Okay. Done? Okay. Now, um, with regards to the Sunnah before us, this is Nafila, which is not Ratiba. It is not an emphatic Sunnah. The difference between the emphatic Sunnah and the regular Nafila or the non emphatic Sunnah is in the case of a Sunnah al Mu'akkada, the emphatic, it is a tradition or a Sunnah, Nafil prayer that the Prophet وسلم, used to do on a regular basis and he have skipped it a few times. Why? So that to distinguish between it as a sunnah and the wajib or the fard or what is mandatory. There is a hadith in this regard. The mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha said, إِنْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَيَدَعُ الْعَمَلَ وَهُوَ يُحِبُّهُ خَشْيَةَ أَنْ يُفْرَضَ عَلَىٰ أَصْحَابِهِ She said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sometimes would interrupt and stop doing some good deeds, some nawafil, um, that he would love to do, but because that he was afraid that his companions may perceive it as a wajib, or it will be imposed upon them as a wajib. I'll continue after this call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Jibril from Libya. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask with Jibril. Please, how are you? How is your life? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Really busy. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we Please, I have two questions for you. My first question is, I want to ask you, there is something called uh, Salat al-Tasbih mm. in Islam. Yeah. Okay, and please, if it is so, how is it performed? And uh, my, my second question. Yeah. My, my second question is uh, about uh, when people got married, the dua that they used to say. So please, is it both the man and the woman, or only the man used to say the dua? No, no, I still didn't get the question, uh, Gabriel. You said when the Prophet was married? No, the couple, the two, uh, the husband and the wife is married. Are you okay? And they uh -huh. want to pray the two rakas before? Used to say, and, and it I guess I get your question. It's about praying the two rakahs before consummating the marriage. Okay, before we take a short break, I'd like to continue the remaining segment of the answer of Sister Sana uh, from Bahrain. Um, so the sunnah before us is a non-emphatic sunnah, which is that the Prophet Sallallahu used to do it sometimes and would skip it some other times. It is less important than the emphatic sunnah. The emphatic sunnah are 12 according to the sound hadith. Four before Dhuhr. It is better to pray them two by two. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah bless on him, he said that four rakahs with one taslim. 
obviously with middle tashahud. Then two rakahs after Dhuhr, and two rakahs after Maghrib, and two units of prayer after Isha, and two before Fajr. The total is 12. Four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, that is six, two units after Maghrib, eight, two units after Isha, 10, and two units of rakah prayers before Fajr, total is 12. And in the sound hadith, the Prophet peace be upon him said, whoever would observe these 12 rakahs of the nawafil or emphatic sunan on regular basis, on daily basis, Allah will build him a house in paradise. There are other non-emphatic sunan, such as the four rakahs before us, and the two rakahs before Maghrib, and the two rakahs before Isha. Barakallah fikum, brothers and sisters. I think uh, we're due to take a short break. We'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes to answer some more of your valuable questions and concerns. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, Sister Sana from Bahrain um, asked about her mother's uh, case uh, that she uh, recently started forgetting a lot. So in the prayers, so she forgets how many sajdas or whether she made rukuwa uh, or not. Uh, if this is something new, which could be a medical condition, which needs some medical attention, we will only focus on the part which concerns us from a religious point of view. Otherwise, sometimes the person needs to have medical uh, checkup when it comes to um, uh, when, when the case becomes chronic. It is not only really limited to the prayer. The person is looking for something while it is in his hand, looking for the glasses while he or she have the glasses on. They f waste 15 minutes looking for their wallets and the wallet is in his hand or the car keys, things like that. Um, it could be, uh, um, you know, a uh, medical condition. May Allah the Almighty give her shifa. Anyway, whatever happens in the prayer, if the person forgets, so number one, the person needs to look into what he is more certain of. Like, you know, I know that I made rukur. I'm not sure whether I made it or not. In this case, we say, اِقْطَعِ الشَّكَّ بِالْيَقِينَ Okay? Dismiss the doubt and consider what you're certain of. But if you're not certain, if you're not sure whatsoever, like you pray three rak'ahs or four, you're in doubt. In this case, the solution is to consider the lesser. Consider them three and pray one more rak'ah, which could be an extra rak'ah. No problem, because he did not do it deliberately. He did it because you assume that he did not pray the last rak'ah. And after you pray, you pray two prostrations, which are known as sajdatay sahw. And simply, Sister Sana, she can pray the two sajdas before the taslim, after reciting the tashahud, or after you make the tashahud, you make, two, you make the taslim. You pray to prostrations, you prostrate yourself twice, then you set up and you make the sleep. Um, if she forgets certain things which are categorized as sunan, in this case, she doesn't have to worry about it and she doesn't have to repeat the rak'ah, rather she can make the two sajda by the end, which are known as sajda tay as sahu. There is a very nice solution to that. If this is something that uh, she developed newly, she needs some uh, moral support from the household. Like, I would advise that always somebody make certain to pray with her in jama'ah. Like if you're with her at home, do not pray by yourself. Say, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Whether she's sitting on her bed or we share or she, if she can move, alhamdulillah, shukla. So when you lead her in jama'ah, she would realize that it was all frustrations. Uh, if you have anyone at home, even men who prayed in the masjid, they can come back and they pray the sunnah and she would follow them in jama'ah. Uh, also, one of the means of the moral support is to sit and watch her while praying. Then you say, mom, you actually prayed for rakahs and you prayed one ruku on each rakah and you made two sujood 
it was all frustrations. You're fine. So that would help her to overcome this new condition, which could happen as a result of senility. May Allah give her shifa. But the solution is, if it is something relating to fard, or ruqn in the prayer, or wajib, simply make it up and pray the two sajda by the end. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdullah from the KSA. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. Kif alik? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. How about yourself, Brother Abdullah? Allah, alhamdulillah. Where are you from? Where are you from? I am from Kenya, but recently in Saudi Arabia. Okay, great. Okay, Nairobi. Nam? From Nairobi. From, uh, no, 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 from Nakuru. Nakuru, okay. <laughs> yes. I have one question, uh, brother. Yeah? Uh, who has the right to stop you from marrying a woman, your, your dad or your mom? And uh, what is the reasons for them that you have to listen to them? Okay. I got because, your question. Uh, maybe you have uh, the first wife, and you want to take a second wife, and then because of their worldly worries, then they stop you, they say you have to do this, you have to wait, prepare for the first wife. So should you listen to them or should you just go by the Sunnah of Rasul and Quran? Okay, okay. Got your question, Brother Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Um Sumaya from Nigeria. Yes, um, I have two questions today. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my first question is, is it compulsory for a female Muslim to cover her feet even when she's going out? Okay. And my second question is, during, after Salah, when I'm um, supplicating, sometimes I feel, um, I feel like, I need to supplicate for everyone. I feel um, like, um, what's the word? Um, I feel like I'm selfish when I'm um, supplicating only for myself. So I supplicate for everyone. I don't know if it's um, Shaitan that is, that is making me supplicate for everyone and not enough for myself. I don't know if it's a good thing. So that's my question. Mm. Okay. Got your question, Sister Um Sumaya. Brother uh, Jibril has two questions. Uh, Gabriel from Libya. The first was about Salatu Tasabih. Some people say that you don't get bored of answering these questions. I, I personally don't get bored. Alhamdulillah. An Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Addallu ala al khayri kafa'ila. Uh, the person who guides somebody to a good thing, then he shall get a similar reward of everyone who would follow his guidance. So uh, as long as you guys are asking questions, I'm benefiting. Alhamdulillah, shukla. It's my pleasure. But the thing is, sometimes the viewers have heard the answer repeatedly. This is the part which really, uh, you know, makes me reluctant to answer the question in very detail. Some of these questions are already on, on the website. You know, but somebody is in need for an answer of this particular question right now. So in brief, we say Salatu Tasabih is an act of worship which has a great deal of controversy over whether it is prescribed in the first place, recommended or not. And the reason is based on um, judging the hadith, the reference, because it's only one hadith narrated by one companion, that is Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle. When the Prophet وسلم, said, shall I not ahbuk, uh, shall I not give you something special, shall I not advise you, shall I not give you a gift? Then he said, certainly then the Prophet وسلم, said that you pray for rak'ahs. And the first rak'ah I recite Surah Al-Fatiha and a Surah. Then after you recite and before making ruku' you say the following 15 times. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. You recite that 15 times. Then you make ruku' and you say it 10 times. 
then you rise up from Rukuah and you say it ten times. Then you say you, you say it in your the first sajda ten times. And when you sit in between the two sajdas, you say it ten times. And you sit in the second sajda ten times. Then um, when you uh, rise up from the sajda and before going up, you say it again ten times. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. That is 70 five times you say subhanallah walhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah wa allahu akbar for dhikr uh, which are known as al baqiyat al salihat 75 times in each rak'ah you do that for the uh, remaining three rak'ahs four rak'ahs then the hadith says that uh, you should do it on a regular basis uh, if you can then at least once a week once a month or once in your lifetime so there are a lot of people based on how many of the scholars judge the hadith as sound or at least hasan and fair they say it is recommended to do it so they do that and especially when they go for umrah and hajj and they want to make it in, in, in the haram while many other imams such as al imam ahmad ibn hanbal he looked into the hadith and said this is a weak hadith and according to his school of thought that it is permissible to act upon a weak hadith when it comes to the virtuous acts. But he himself said uh, that's something that he wouldn't recommend to do. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, likewise, he said this is not a hadith that we can base an act of worship upon. So there is a difference of opinion. Many of the scholars are of the view, such as Ibn Abdin and others, are of the view that it's a sunnah and it's recommended to do it. And as you know, this is our tradition. We do not just uh, focus on one school of thought and we do not give a unilateral opinion and say this is it and you have to follow this. Especially whenever there is a room for a difference of opinion. So, what do I personally do? When I was young I used to offer Salat al-Tasabih. Then when I realized that subhanallah, uh, if I have time to do it, there are many other acts of worship which are 100% confirmed. Allah the Almighty says to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا So he prescribed the tahajjud prayer at night. Long recitation of the Quran, long standing, long ruku, long sujood. This is something that Allah loves. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the night prayer شرف المؤمن it is the honor of the believer in order to be honored, to be noble, pray at night. So this is something that has been confirmed by both the Quran and the Sunnah. The emphatic and non-emphatic Sunnah, the water prayer and the duha prayer is definitely an alternative. But if you still uh, would like to offer the prayer according to the schools uh, of the different scholars, who are many by the way, who adopted the view that the hadith is okay and you can, uh, you should offer the prayer at least once in your lifetime. I already discussed with you how to pray Salatul Tasabih. May Allah the Almighty accept. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Noor from Sudan. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Huda. Sister Noor, Sudan is not that far away from us. Can you hear me? I'd like to have the number for the chef, please. Can I have the number for the chef? Okay, the brother is in the control. Oh, please pass on my number to her. Thank you, Sister Noor. Uh, the supplication before uh, not only consummating the marriage, Brother Jibril, because it's not one time invocation, rather, on every single time, a husband and wife, Muslims, who would like to have sexual relations. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتِي أَهْلَهُ قَالْ um, If any of you before embracing sexually his wife were to say, اللهم جنبنا الشيطان وجنب الشيطان ما رزقتنا So this is a supplication. O oh Allah, جنبنا الشيطان Protect us against Satan. Keep Satan away from us. وَجَنَّبِ الشَّيْطَانَ مَا رَزَقْتَنَا If there would be a child as a result of the sexual relations, protect him and keep him away from Satan and keep Satan away from him as well. 
If the husband only said it, that is fine because the dua is sufficient. But if the husband and wife both said it, that is even better. Okay? And they should remind each other this is considered ta'awun, helping one another to achieve what is good and what is righteous. As Allah the Almighty said in the second ayah of Surah Al Ma'idah, wa ta'awanu ala al birri wa taqwa. Subhanallah. When the person is about to satisfy his sexual desire, and sometimes it is very urgent, and the person doesn't think about anything other than the sexual desire, his desire. We're talking about halal, pure halal. But hey, before that, you remember that Allah taught us that there is a supplication in this regard as well. You know, I'm so tired, sleepy, and I cannot stand on foot. There is a supplication before going to sleep to protect you to give you a good night's sleep, to enjoy your rest. Bismik Allahumma amutu ahya. Recite the last three chapters of the Quran. You recite Ayatul Kursi, the greatest ayah of the Quran, the last couple ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. This is very important to show Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that even in your joyful moments, you do not forget Him. You remember Him all the time. And this remembrance is a means of protection for you and for your spouse. Assalamu alaikum. Akhi Arfan from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, sir, I actually, you know, I have uh, many questions, but actually I'll just narrow down to one, uh, a couple of ones. Uh, the first question is uh, about the missed uh, uh, Ramadan fast. Uh, due to some traveling or something, and can uh, when it comes in the when it is in the in Shawwal, do I have to fast the Shawwal first and then I can make up the next Ramadan fast? This is my first question. Or is there an order or is there anything something like this? This is my first question, I want. Okay. The second the second question is what is the feeling of repentance? Do we do we actually have any kind of a feeling of repentance because you know I we, the, the whatever sins we have done in the past and we do each and every day I don't feel uh, I feel that you know I keep asking for repentance every time in the every salah every 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 opportunity I get so I just wanted to know like is there a feeling of uh, a sense of uh, uh, feeling of repentance mm. okay uh, well, these are the two questions which I have right now. I would be really thankful if you can answer. Thank you. Got it. Akhi Arfan, with regards to if somebody missed a few days in Ramadan, you traveling sickness, and then uh, Ramadan is over, and as you all know that there is a sound hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever observes fasting during the month of Ramadan and then follows that by fasting six days during the following one month, which is Shawwal, uh, its reward is similar to the reward of fasting for the entire year or the entire life. So his question is, do I have to make up the missed fasting first? Yes, you should make up the missed days fasting first because this is a priority. And the scholars understood from the literal meaning of the hadith, whoever observes fasting during Ramadan, first you fast Ramadan, then at ba'ahu, then you follow that by fasting. So you haven't fasted during Ramadan yet, except if the missed days are too many, um, such, uh, such as women who have their menses for 10 days, 12 days, 13 days, or they have an excuse. So it's impossible for them to fast both, to make up the missed days and fast shawwal. In addition to what Aisha radiallahu anha said that, I used to postpone my, you know, making up the fasting of the missed days of Ramadan until Sha'ban of the following year. So to give you ease, if you can do both, this is the ideal situation. If it is a bit hard for you, then you can fast the days of Shawwal, then you make up the rest of the days of Ramadan, which you must. May Allah accept. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, please try again. Um, Arfan also inquired about the feeling of repentance. You know what? You just asked a beautiful question. You know why? Because the feeling of repentance is the most beautiful feeling ever. It is the feeling of when somebody is lost. 
when somebody's car's engine went down, burned out, and he got stuck in the middle of nowhere, then all of a sudden he got the help. Imagine what Allah the Almighty does and what he says in the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, لَاللَّهُ أَفْرَحُ بِتَوْبَةِ أَحَدِكُمْ Indeed, Allah is more happier than the following case, whenever any of you come to repent. Allah is happier than whom? Happier than somebody who is traveling and traveling on the back of his camel. Then when he got off, when he disembarked uh, to do whatever, his camel ran off. So it ran off with all the provision, with all the water, the means of livelihood. So he was certain that he will vanish there. So he sat where he ended up waiting for his turn. He was certain that he's going to die there. He's in the middle of nowhere. Then while he was lying down, he saw the rope of the camel hanging from its neck. The camel returned back to him. So he jumped. And out of joy and delight, he wanted to thank Allah for saving and sparing his life. So he said, Oh Allah, thank you indeed. You are my servant and I'm your Lord. He erred out of extreme joy. Allah is happier whenever you, me, and every believer repent unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than did this person who made the error because of... When do you have that feeling, brothers and sisters? You have that feeling when your repentance is true. What do you mean? Is there a true repentance and a fake one? Of course. Many of us make istighfar which requires istighfar. What does it mean? That when you keep saying by your tongue, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, and you're not really intending to repent. Uh, recently in the haram, you know, we see people coming from Ihram, from, they just finished uh, a sa'i. They did tawaf and sa'i, they finished their umrah. On the way to get tahallul, they smoke. Plenty of them. I go to them one by one. I don't get tired talking to tens of them. I say, Akhi, you're in the haram. Even if it is halal, but it is offending to others. Okay? So he says, astaghfirullah, but he's still smoking. Astaghfirullah, or may Allah forgive me. From what? From a sin, you know that's a sin? Why don't you quit it? It will not be called repentance unless if you quit the sin. Imagine a thief is breaking into somebody's house, stealing and keeps saying, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, Astaghfirullah, Subhanallah wa hamdi. Are you kidding me? Are you joking? Then this istighfar is mockery. So he needs to make istighfar from this kind of istighfar. He needs to repent. Wallahi. If one is sincere in his repentance, the girl whom he used to chat with and he used to spend very lovely time with her online whenever they go out and he would be anxiously waiting for her to call him or to spend hours. Now when he lines up before Allah to pray, that situation will be a lot better and dearer to his heart than hanging out with this girl. That's a sign that he really repented. And this is the kind of feeling you get that you enjoy it. We said before that, إِنَّ لِلْحَسَنَةِ Indeed, when you commit a good deed, when you do a good thing, including repentance, there is a nur in the heart, there is a light on the face, there is a barakah in the rizq, there is mahabba in the hearts of people. You experience everything around you has changed. This is the kind of feeling you get when you sincerely repent. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Allah the Almighty says, Oh, you believe all of you turn unto Allah with repentance in order to be successful. Success comes with repentance. May Allah grant us sincere repentance and grant us accordingly success. Until next time, I leave you all in the care of Allah. I say this word and I pray for you and for you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech.